on that. So nutrition must be important. Um, you remember before Samson was born, what the angel told his mom? Huh? No strong wine? Put her on a diet. <laughs> Put her on a diet. Same thing happened with the mother of Jesus, with Mary. So that was kind of really, really, <laughs> really important. Now, we as Adventists, we pride ourselves with the, the right arm of the gospel, you know, the health ministry. We base it in some of the uh, dietary recommendations, uh, the avoidance of anything that is harmful to our body. And uh, we've also seen where the rest of the world has caught up. The American Medical Association now is asking that plant-based um, diets be prepared for persons who have undergone cardiac procedures. Can you imagine coming out of a cardiac procedure and somebody giving you some eggs and ham for breakfast? <laughs> the very same thing that got you there in the first place. <laughs> so even uh, some of these organizations have caught on to what hypocrisy said many, many, many years ago. Let your medicine be your food. That's right. Let your food be your medicine and your medicine be your food. So uh, another thing that uh, we did the other day was the health expo. Remember going by the nutrition, <laughs> the nutrition station, and we talked about um, things like syndrome X, uh, where your cholesterol, um, your waist circumference, your blood pressure, and your blood sugar, they all play a part in what we call syndrome X or metabolic syndrome, which can predispose you to diabetes. And with diabetes and obesity comes a whole lot of complications, um, ranging from uh, fatigue to blindness, heart disease. And as we know, heart disease is the number one killer in this country. Okay? Heart disease, cancers, and strokes, the big three. We've seen before, and we've talked about plant-based diets used as far back as the 70s, late 60s, early 70s, by other cardiologists, not church people. And they could prove that some of this coronary artery disease in our heart was reversed by applying this diet, food only. Of course, they, they recommended not smoking. <laughs> they recommended moderate form of exercise, which we should all do. But it was so powerful that this has been published in the literature in the Lancet Journal since the, the 70s. So nutrition is huge and the influence is far reaching. Now, anybody remembers the isoflavones? It was in that nutritional handout, isoflavones. Anybody remember that? It's like, ooh, I don't. <laughs> These are chemicals found in plant food, okay, that help to reduce the incidence uh, or uh, problems with breast cancer, prostate cancer, heart disease because they help to lower cholesterol. It also helps with uh, menopause, hot flashes. <laughs> and so what are these isoflavones? They also help in bone um, health. Where do we find them? In which uh, group of plants do we really find them? We usually find them in legumes, especially soya, soya beans. And they've done multiple uh, studies in Asia, among the Asian people, and they see that where they are started at an early age and even carried into adulthood with these uh, soya beans, they had decreased incidence of heart attacks, they had decreased incidence of these cancers, and some of them who were on the diet did better even when they got the disease and started this plant-based diet. So. God knows what he was talking about with the plant-based diet, eh? If he had told Adam and Eve to go out there and eat the sheep and, you know, the ducks or whatever, the chickens, <laughs> then that would be a whole different thing. But I believe um, that even when we get to heaven, we will have a plant-based diet. Just as how there were trees back there, with fruits, with the leaves, the healing of the nation, going to be the same in heaven. Um, don't know if they're going to have mangoes. I hope they do. <laughs> now, <laughs> now uh, part of our 
expose today or part of our discussion is going to include um, one of my favorites, fruits and vegetables. Um, we talked a lot about fats and carbohydrates before, but the fruits and vegetables I think should be part of our diet. Now, I know we live in Amarillo. <laughs> I know we can't just walk outside and you know, pick a bunch of fruits. Uh, but I do believe that wherever it's available, and if we can budget for it, we should try and get it. Um, and we're going to look at our slideshow, which is ready, yes. Um, look at some of the health benefits here. See if this clicker is working. Maybe I can ask the remote clicker. There we go, thank you. <laughs> and so the importance of the benefits of fruits and vegetables, as we can see, providing these minerals and vitamins, um, all these essential enzymes, uh, and the big word, antioxidants, um, to help keep our bodies uh, going. And fiber, we're going to look at what are the recommendations what they contain, and what are the benefits, and so forth and so on. Oops. I think this is upside down. OK. <laughs> now, the USDA, uh, United States Department of Agriculture, has given us certain serving sizes and stuff that we can uh, correlate with whatever we use, which is kind of nice. I think I'm breaking this thing. Um, and most importantly, fruits provide a certain amount of uh, fluid, liquid, um, uncon uh, uncon uh, contaminated, you know, <laughs> the nearest thing to pure, the purest form of water that helps us because our bodies are made up of how much percent of water? 10? 70 80. That's right. 70 to 80 percent of our body is made up of water. And fruits provide a source of that fluid. Uh, sugars. Now, I know for some people, bananas make them constipated. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but there are other fruits, you know, oranges, apples, watermelons, and so forth, that provide a certain amount of natural sugar, not the refined stuff. And, and I think that's the crazy stuff. We, we get rid of meats. We don't smoke or drink. But then the refined stuff gets us, the sugar, the flour. Um, and we'll see a little bit more about that as we go along. Fiber, super duper important. Um, providing cancer prevention, where it inhibits the reproduction of the cells in the body. And it also helps with that nice um, big word there, apoptosis. Anybody knows what that means? Apoptosis. Think about it as blowing up bad cells. <laughs> Makes them pop. <laughs> so cholesterol and blood sugar balance, um, and also stress reduction. Now, fiber is huge. We know that uh, meat slows things down in our gut. And that just gives time for uh, the bad bacteria to work and uh, cause many different things, including diverticulosis, cancers, and so forth. Fiber helps things to move along, move along. <laughs> uh, some people will tell you, well, I only go to the bathroom once a week or twice a month. And you, that's when you bust out the, the fiber. <laughs> and um, if you aren't get, able to get it naturally, you go to the supermarket, you see the all brand or the buds. Um, use anything you can, but get enough fiber to fight against cancer, cholesterol, and so forth and so on. Fruits provide organic acids. And these are like uh, things that help to keep our blood pH level at a certain amount, and also our urine. Uh, anytime you have issues with your bladder, and ladies can relate to this, you know, they want you to get enough stuff in there to alkalize the urine and get things going so that the, uh, the stick, that stuff that sticks to your bladder doesn't cause a UTI, right? especially if you don't drink enough water. Uh, vitamins, we know all about the vitamins, uh, vitamin C and A, powerful antioxidants. Uh, I used to remember how there were people who would smoke, but they would also eat oranges. 
<laughs> and the funny thing is, it somehow seemed to work because these guys seem to last a while, you know. And I, I thought to myself, well, if you don't smoke and you use antioxidants, you probably live even longer. So something to think about: minerals, potassium, magnesium, calcium. All of these. Uh, electrolytes we don't even think about are super important to our body so that the cells can function very well. Um, yeah, we'll just skip that. Phytochemicals, what's that? Phytochemicals. These are chemical substances found in plants. And you can see where they help to prevent arteriosclerosis, which is a buildup of um, cholesterol and deposits in our coronary arteries, and we saw the little video the last time of how the plaque was formed and how it erupted and causes heart attacks and so forth. These are probably extremely important. If we're trying to prevent the number one killer, this is where you want to start. So this is why I like fruits, the subject on fruits and vegetables so much. Uh, even better than the stuff on carbohydrates and fats and proteins and all that stuff. For me, we should start with fruits and vegetables. Um, very important for our nutrition. Helping with the fluidity of the blood or the viscosity and preventing cancers. And here is where it gets into the whole color schemes. Uh, blueberries, what are those good for? Um, lowers risk of cancer, helps with memory function, um, helps to keep your urinary tract nice and clear, helps prevent the tannins from sticking to the walls of your bladder and causes, uh, causing infections. Uh, um, excellent anti-aging benefits. Yeah, you don't have to use as much of that oil overlay <laughs> or whatever stuff. That's a real, this is a real deal. The green stuff helps to lower cancers, healthy vision, strong bones and teeth. And as you can see, whoops, speeding up a little bit there. There we go. As you can see, these are the, um, the phytochemicals or chemicals in the plants that help with that. Cauliflowers and such, the white, the brown, and tan stuff helps with a healthy heart. Also, again, preventing cancers. And the allicins. <laughs> the allicins. <laughs> Those are the stuff that has a lot of sulfur in there and are related to uh, the garlics, okay? Um, if you worry about bad breath by just chewing the clothes, they now have those little gel caps that are odor-free. Awesome stuff. <laughs> I know some of the husbands will be happy for that. <laughs> but uh, but <laughs> very important, very important. Um, the Notice that even the recommendation now is that if you can use the garlic, it also helps to regulate your blood pressure. Um, and that is something natural. That is something we all can uh, do. The yellow and the orange, which helps with um, The vision, the immune system, and lowering risk of other cancers, things in cantaloupes and carrots and stuff like that. Um, these are some of the benefits of these uh, fruits and vegetables. Red tomato, um, healthy heart, memory function, lowers cancer, and also helps with bladder health. Now we come to the fat-soluble vitamins and the water-soluble vitamins. This is just a fancy way of saying vitamin A, D, E, and K are fat-soluble and are stored in the fatty tissues, help with the, our membranes of our cells to keep stuff out and in and so forth. And the water-soluble vitamins, well, that's most likely everything else. I just wanted to pause here to mention that they noticed that some vegans and vegetarians we're having the same amount of heart problems and issues as meat eaters. And for a while, they were stumped. And they found two important things going on. Um, the omega-3 and the omega-6 that is supposed to help us, um, they found that the ratio was important. If you had too much omega-6, more than the omega-3, you are kind of getting into trouble. You are breaking down the wrong enzymes and you are causing more inflammation. So the recommendation is to have more omega-3 than the omega-6. 
And what they were finding about, finding out was that the vegans and the vegetarians, you know, all this omega-6 stuff, they were piling it up, and they were having five times more the amount of omega-6 to omega-3s. So they recommended, what's, where do we find omega-3? <laughs> Very good. Flaxseed, right? Flaxseed, flaxseed oil, walnuts, green leafy vegetables. They recommend that one to two tablespoons, tablespoons of crushed flax seeds will help to keep that balance right and prevent the problems um, that they were having. And also, when it comes to homocysteine, this is something in the body that we want to kind of keep low, okay? They were realizing that they were having issues here because their B12 and their folate levels were low. Um, folate we can fi find in a lot of plant-based stuff. B12, however, is usually in animal products. Now, we may have to take supplements for that, and that's okay, that's okay. We only need like about 1,000 micrograms of B12 every day, okay? And they come in gummy bites now, which is kind of cool, but be careful. Your, your dentist doesn't want you using gummy bites or gummies unless you're brushing your teeth properly after taking them. Okay, some of them stick to your teeth <laughs> and help to promote cavities. So if you're gonna do the, the B12, if you can do the capsules, very good. If you prefer the gummy bites, brush your teeth, all right? But this is, a mo this is very important uh, because they were looking in the studies recently in the last 10 to 15 years, and they were finding, why are these vegans not doing uh, as well as we thought they would? And it was all because of the, the, the ratio of the omega-3 and omega-6 and also the low levels of B12 and folate that they had. Now, ladies have heard about folate or folic acid before. When you get pregnant, what's the first thing, that one, of the, one of the first things the doctors put you on? Folic acid, why? Why, <laughs> why folic acid? Remember how important that is? In the baby, the development of the brain and the spinal cord is important, and if you don't have enough folate, you can lead to defects in your spinal cord, like spinal bifida and stuff like that. So, so you ladies already are ahead of that, and you know where to get your folate and build on your folate. But now you know it helps to lower homocysteine, prevent the inflammation that causes all these heart problems and stuff, and is a great benefit to you, okay? So just wanted to make sure we got clear on the omega-6, omega-3 thing, and the flax seeds. <laughs> And here are sources of our fat-soluble vitamins and water-soluble vitamins. Um, on the left, we can see where you have the blackberries, the cantaloupe, so forth. You do have a little bit of overlapping, which is okay. Um, and on the right, you have your spinach, your green peppers, and so forth, kiwi, grapefruit. Has anybody had grapefruit recently? Where did you find grapefruit? <laughs> we had some here in the city. OK, OK. Walmart cares. Well, okay. Grapefruit, we have a grapefruit tree back home in my dad's yard. So, <laughs> and the funny thing, it was growing in the neighbor's yard, but a lot of the branches were over the fence. <laughs> so, so it was easy to just walk by a da la la, <laughs> grab your grapefruit fresh off the tree. Things that uh, I spoke recently to one of the caregivers of my parents. And she's complaining how one of the other ladies keeps taking away all the apples. We have a thing, uh, Oti'iti apple, it's a, it's a Caribbean apple. And I'm, th I'm trying to remember when last I ate one of those things. You know, some of the things, the fruits and stuff. Um, but yeah, going over the list was kind of nostalgic. Now, we, now they've done studies to show how powerful these, the benefit of vitamin C is uh, that we get from fruits. Not only it, is it a powerful antioxidant, it's a powerful anti-inflammatory uh, chemical. And in asthma, what's going on in asthma? What are the two things that bother people with asthma? The, that's right. You got the inflammation with the, the leakage or seepage of all this mucus and, and stuff and gunk, and then you have the bronchospasm where the, the airways close up and you get that wheezing. So they've seen where this helps to decrease significantly the inflammation symptoms in asthma. And, and that, is, that is beautiful, that is golden for, for kids. And I feel bad for a lot of uh, inner city kids who grew up in these, um, 
how should I call them? Uh, housing situations, uh, concrete jungles, uh, not getting enough of their, their sunlight, their fresh air, their, their vitamin C's and stuff. Um, and there have been parents who have had to make the decision to move away from some of these urban places so that they can get the fresh air, the fresh fruits and stuff they need and they do better. Um, there are some folks who will tell you uh, who have COPD or emphysema. Uh, they go to the big cities and they, they have a hard time. They have to use their inhalers more or they have to rely on their nebulizer. They come back out to the country, no problem. So, so very good plug here for vitamin C. Um, atherosclerosis, which we talked about, the buildup of the plaque and the subsequent rupture. Um, here they are mentioning the importance of fiber, the pectin. Um, I'll also throw in here the, the isoflate bones that help with the reduction of cholesterol. Anything that reduces cholesterol is super important. Um, the cholesterol gets deposited into the wall, as you know, builds up, and then you have the rupture, and that's how you get your heart attacks. Note that the cardiologists now are promoting, and there's one in Houston who actually has a little cafe by his office where he does plant-based diet stuff only. Oh, and he had a patient, that we saw the interview on the documentary, where uh, a gentleman who could barely walk, okay, barely walk, was dependent on his oxygen, um, had uh, four heart medications or five heart medications. After he started him on the plant-based diet, started lowering his cholesterol and stuff, the guy walks into the office now without the walker, has no need for oxygen, and this happened over a period of a few months. So, and so this is powerful stuff, and the guy isn't even Adventist, eh? And that's a sobering part, eh? The, 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 the non-Adventists have taken this and they're, they're, they're going full speed ahead. We have athletes who are on plant-based diets. Uh, there was a young lady with uh, arthritis, heavy set breathing issues, went on her plant-based diet. She had about 18 medications. Uh, she basically is down to probably two now. Walking well, she couldn't even walk a few steps without sitting down on her rolling walker. Now she can walk actually around the block. Um, so this is powerful stuff that even non-Adventists are looking at based on just nutrition. Based on just nutrition only. That's where we start. Um, Bronchitis, also important again, a diet high in antioxidants um, seems to help protect against the damaging uh, effect of all these free radicals coming from the cigarette smoke. And cigarette smoke is pure poison, eh? If we can avoid it, stay away from it. Um, fortunately, a lot of us can't even stand the smell of cigarette smoke, which is a good thing. <laughs> it's a good thing. Um, and so they have done studies showing that increasing your food consumption can reduce the risk of developing these uh, chronic lung disease like bronchitis and emphysema and so forth. And of course, the big cancer. Uh, we talked about folate, but they also mentioned here selenium, vitamin C, and other antioxidant um, phytochemicals um, helping to prevent or neutralize the harmful products of all these cancers. Um, so, I mean, we, we, and this is just fruits and vegetables. We haven't talked about grains or nuts <laughs> or anything else, okay? Um, here we go. A diet rich in fruits and vegetables can, be, can reduce about 20% of all the cancers. It can even prevent about 20% of all the cancers just by that switch. That's one in five, okay? That's, that's super, super important. Um, cardiovascular disease, and we've talked about this already, 30% lower risk of heart attacks compared to men who ate fewer foods in the prudent category. Uh, we all know about the DASH diet, um, the diet that helps with hypertension, and one of the, the foundation uh, principles there, fruits and vegetables. Avoid the greasy stuff, avoid the, the, the fatty stuff. And all of this is basically a rule for a lot of us. Diabetes. Here again, the importance of fiber um, and how pectin in the fruit, especially in the skin of some of the fruits like apples, 
can help to improve our glucose uh, tolerance in some studies. Now, we're seeing more and more maturity onset diabetes. This is diabetes that usually happens as we get a bit older. As we get a bit older, we notice certain things. Our blood vessels become harder, our blood pressure goes up, our hair gets white. <laughs> uh, sometimes it goes away. <laughs> um, notice the joints kind of get a little creaky and stiff. Um, so what happens to our blood sugar and other things? Our, also, our insulin resistance becomes higher and our blood sugar tends to go up. So as we get older, I think it is a good idea to give, you know, get a little bit more fiber. Uh, um, whichever fiber you find that works for you. Of course, natural is best. You know, plant-based is always best. Um, if you have to do a little bit, bit extra of cereal, I know some people don't like oatmeal and, <laughs> and all that kind of stuff. But uh, whatever you can do to get enough fiber, this will help to reduce the risk of that maturity onset diabetes. They showed a documentary with two uh, cab drivers in New York. Uh, both of them of Southeast Asian um, origin. That is, they, both of them were from India. One of them grew up in a rural section of India on the farm, you know, had to do a lot of work and had mostly vegetables and fruits. And one guy grew up in the city, in uh, Mumbai, in, in, in Bombay. And he was used to all the fried foods and sweets and snacks and so forth. Well, guess what happened to these two gentlemen when they migrated to the United States and start working as cab drivers in New York? Bingo, fast food, because New York is a city that never sleeps, right? So here these guys are driving around looking for their fares, and, and they stop and grab some of this and stop and grab some of that and just keep going. And guess which one ended up with diabetes? The country boy. The country boy ended up with diabetes. The, sit, the city slicker, the fellow who grew up in the city back in Mumbai with all that stuff, he was right at home in New York. You know, no major changes. But the poor fellow who was used to uh, a healthier diet and lifestyle got to New York, became sedentary, driving around all day, eating all this stuff, and maturity onset diabetes got him. So it's very important, especially for those of us who are from the rural areas that are used to this kind of healthy food and fruits and vegetables and healthy lifestyle, to stick with it. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't let, don't let the, the, the city change you, okay? A heart attack, a high fiber diet. We talked about fruits that help to reduce uh, cholesterol in vegetables, a plant-based um, diet, as we mentioned before. Cholesterol, we talked about the lowering of cholesterol and so forth and so on. Hypertension. Now, this part I found quite interesting. We know that there are some ACE inhibiting products or chemicals in plant based food. Now, when you go to the doctor and they see that your blood pressure is high, one of the first things they want to put you on is a water pill, a diuretic. Okay? The second thing they want to put you on is an ACE inhibitor especially if you're Caucasian, male, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if you're a female and you plan to get pregnant, they're not going to put you on that, okay? And if, especially if you're African-American, they may put you on something else. They may put you on a calcium channel blocker or something with, with uh, different, a beta blocker, depending on what is going on. But ACE inhibitors, by far, number one prescribed along with diuretics. Plants have natural ACE inhibiting properties. And so a diet, in a uh, plant-based diet, especially fruits and vegetables, guess what? Helps to lower your blood pressure. And we've seen it from experience with a lot of people we know. They start leaving off the steak <laughs> and the rich, fatty, sweet food and start doing the plant-based diet. And what happens? Their, their, their blood pressure starts to come down. So that's a very important thing to remember um, for people with blood pressure. Now they talked about um, potassium. Uh, the only good thing I can say about that really is if you're on a diuretic, like Lasix, hydrochlorothiazide, one of those, um, you know, furosemide, they tend to make the kidney get rid of potassium. So you have to uh, supplement it. 
And if anyone has seen what a potassium pill looks like, it's a huge pill. I don't know why they can't make it smaller. Uh, but we had a, a case recently. This fellow was taking um, six of these pills, and he was fed up. Uh, we reviewed his medications. We saw where he was put on this older generation, and it's the number one recommended diuretic. But every time he took it, he was washing out his potassium. And so what do you do for that? Do you change, they, instead of changing it, they just gave him more potassium pills until he had to be choking literally on these potassium pills. He was not happy. So we switched it, and guess what? Potassium slowly started coming up. We had to back off the potassium supplements. We got to the point where we said, look, he was down to one pill. We said, we can get rid of this completely you know, if we keep doing our little thing here. And he says, you know what, I'll stick with that one pill. <laughs> I guess he had gotten so <laughs> addicted to it, but he would not have more than one. And so that was a compromise. But important uh, thing about potassium and hypertension, depending on what medications you're taking. Now, it says here potassium reduces urinary calcium excretion. People who have a high amount of that are, are at low risk of forming uh, kidney stones. Um, this to me is kind of, depending on your school of thought, you could have a nice debate about this. <laughs> now if you're a truck driver and being trained in health sciences in this area, one of the first things you're going to notice is that you get a bunch of truck drivers coming in, um, flank pain, you know, uh, may have a little fever and stuff, may have a little pile on a Friday or UTI, do the CT scan and what do you see? big old kidney stones, sometimes obstructing. Because what do they do? Drive all day, they're not drinking water. If they drink, what do they drink? Calcium. Sodas, yes. Too much calcium and stuff, and so they get kidney stones. Now the best thing to do is to avoid <laughs> the sodas, stay hydrated, and, um, and believe it or not, dehydration is still in the top 10 Medicare admission diagnoses to the hospitals. Dehydration. You're probably saying, Doc, you're crazy. No, dehydration still remains an admittable diagnosis for Medicare patients in the hospitals. The ones who come to the ER, get some IV fluids, go upstairs to continue their hydration. Very important. So fruits help, fluids help. Speaking about fluids, fluids help. <laughs> so keep... Uh, Keep hydrated, eh? Stroke research has been on and on forever and ever. Um, number one risk factor for stroke is? High blood pressure. High blood pressure. Once upon a time there was a big debate about smoking and some other stuff, high blood pressure. So I remember we talked about garlic and all that stuff and plant-based diets re reducing blood pressure, very important. But also they found that flavonoids found in fruit and vegetables have also been inconsistently associated with decreased stroke risk. Um, basically, what we've been talking about for a while, um, helping to reduce your stroke risk by keeping your blood pressure low, et cetera, et cetera. They didn't want to give us the full score on that one. Enzymes help digest food into simple substances that body cells can use for energy. Um, and they help to make the substances within the cells that we can't get through our diet. Now, what is so important about these enzymes? We mentioned before that with omega-3 and omega-6, the omega-3 is broken down and parts of the enzymes that are formed keep the inflammation low so you don't have the cardiac issues going on. Uh, the omega-6 is not that bad, but not that good, but the omega-3 definitely. And the enzymes, guess what happens when we overcook our, our vegetables? We destroy them. So we have to be careful that we get enough of fresh fruits and vegetables. Uh, they like to use the word raw. <laughs> Not sure why. Why does it have to be raw? When I think raw, I think of fish. You ever been to a fish market? Yeah. 
Yeah, yes, yeah. So I like to say fresh, <laughs> fresh freshly uh, obtained, procured. Uh, if you have a garden, even better. Uh, enzymes are very important. Cooking or processing our fruits and vegetables, canning them, all that kind of stuff, kind of you know messes up the enzymes that we need in our body to help keep the inflammation down. So remember, fresh is good. Um, they talk about what the enzymes do, breaking down the molecules, improving digestion, skin quality, risk of heart disease, um, enhancing immunities, and increasing our energy level. And here we go again, all raw foods, <laughs> uh, raw foods contain exactly the right enzymes required to split every last molecule into the basic, basic building blocks of metabolism. It's um, raw, fresh. <laughs> fresh. <laughs> um, and here is the, the, what we were talking about where cooking can destroy some of the phytochemicals, some of these plant-based chemicals. So it's best to have a combination if you need to. What's the best way to cook vegetables if you're going to cook them? Because I know for some people, and some people think I'm weird when I say this, but spinach? <laughs> you know, give me callaloo, pak chow, but spinach? Those big old leaves when somebody gives you a plate of vegetables, I'm, I'm kind of, I still have a, you, you see me wasting time chopping it up as much as possible. <laughs> if you steam it for me, we're good. So steaming is better than boiling, helps retain the water soluble vitamin B and C. Um, and it keeps cooking time to a minimum. They have all sorts of fancy gadgets there, now uh, out there. Um, I used to remember when we, had to cook in something like a wok, and you steam it in that real quick, you know, and get it fresh. Oh, that was good. Now, things that affect it, of course, if it's cooked at a high temperature or for a long time, the heat sensitive nutrients, you know, such as our B and C vitamins and folate, they get destroyed. So, steam if you can, and juicing. Now, this is important. Have you ever juiced before? Anybody ever juiced before? You take like, 20 apples and oranges and juice it down and you get like half a cup. <laughs> I, I believe um, this is good because it gives you a concentrated form of your vitamins, your, mineral, your minerals and your antioxidants. And it's pretty, uh, to me, I know some people think it's cheating, but what would you rather do? Eat 20 apples or probably have a, a glass of that freshly juiced you know, apple? You know, now some of the juicers, I believe, separate the pulp, mm -hmm. and some will keep it nice and complete or whatever. And I noticed this nurse practitioner I work with, she, I don't know what she uses. I need to find out what it is. I think she told me once, but I forgot. Her stuff mixes everything together, yeah. which is kind of, yes, it keeps the fiber and everything. And she comes to work with that thing full of green stuff. Um, but but it, it, she, she has the energy, she's doing well, I mean, and, and I think that's the one we should lean towards, okay? Some people like to get rid of the pulp so they can feed their dog or, I don't know, do other stuff with it. But I do believe if we keep the fiber, it's a big plus. So in juicing, um, choose whatever method is going to help you get the maximum effect, okay, and benefit. And he told you not to juice? Yeah, because he said it's sugar because I'm diabetic. Okay, now that's a very important point. If you are diabetic, and depending on what type of diabetes you have, what medication you're using, um, you have to be careful of what you put in your juicing stuff. For example, you may not use as much fruits, but it's okay to use more vegetables. Um, I saw where a lady put some kale, some cucumbers, and she only added one green apple to the whole mix. And so she had parsley in there and everything. She had uh, a, a big chunk of, um, of ginger uh, in there. <laughs> Just to, <laughs> but she used the cucumber to provide fluid and also neutralize some of the the ginger and also the apple to give it just the amount of sugar that was needed. So it's kind of like a science. If you Google vegetarian restaurants or juice bars near me in Amarillo, you may come up with a whole bunch of different things. 
But for you, you may have to individualize it based on what you know your glycemic index is. That's just a big fancy word to say, how high does my sugar go when I eat certain things? Maria says string green beans is good for like diabetes too. Very good, excellent. You know what else is good? And, I, and, and um, a lot of people don't, didn't know this, avocado leaves. Avocado leaves, yes. There's a diabetic in Florida that rants and raves about his avocado leaves and he's, he's trying to send me some, <laughs> you know, and his string beans. Yes, you're absolutely right. So, because both of us can have diabetes, but I eat one apple, my sugar goes through the roof. You eat one apple, your sugar goes up by maybe two points. So depending on your glycemic index, and that takes a little bit of trial and error or a little science, depending on how much time you want to invest in it, will reveal to you how much you can put and how much you can use. Um, but if that is a case where he's worried about the sugar content, especially if your sugar is very labile, it's all over the place, then use more of the green stuff, use less of the, the sugary stuff. Um, grapes might be not such a good idea for you, but you can use other things. And you know, just watch the ratios and the proportions and everything. Um, did you find a video on juicing or? I can't look what you're doing your thing, so we're gonna pull it up as soon as you're gonna talk when you get to your last your last one. Or okay, or we let Sister Harris talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the resolution is to aim for at least nine servings of vegetables and fruits a day. That's no easy feat. <laughs> That's no easy feat unless your servings are real small. You know? Now the nice thing about juicing, guess what happens with juicing? Juicing kind of concentrates that. So I think that's a good thing to look at. Make sure you get the right variety, uh, the mix of nutrients you need. Uh, notice the focus on the dark leafy greens, uh, cooked tomatoes, anything that is rich in yellow, orange, or red color. And the uh, text from Genesis, and God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in the which is a fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat. We can use legumes, we can use nuts to replace a lot of our meats and fats. We don't have to miss meat, <laughs> you know. Now, my wife will tell you a different story about that. <laughs> you know, one of the biggest challenges, you know, when it comes to subject of nutrition, it can test your faith. <laughs> it, it can test your, your, your relationships with your family and your friends. Um, it can test your patience. <laughs> and so, I would highly recommend you know, maintaining a strong relationship with, with your Heavenly Father and allowing the Holy Spirit to guide you a little at a time. Because um, it, it can be a, <laughs> it can be a challenge. But um, for those of you who have already tested it and see, seen where it's true, um, just, you know, keep up the good work and share the information you can with others. Um, and encourage everyone, you know, that, that wants to make the change or are, who are in the process of changing. You know, my wife is very, uh, what's the word now? She, you know, I try to whip out some sort of plant-based thing. And she's like, don't you want some fish? <laughs> and yeah, that's, I'm, I'm finally easing off fish. And so it's, it's been, it's been interesting. It's been interesting, but uh, be patient with your with your loved ones, eh? <laughs> um, you, I, have you found anything yet, or? Uh, did you say it was Jason 101 for beginners? Yes. Okay. There's a there's a little video clip, if time allows, that we can look at real quickly about juicing. Um, What's that one on the market? Was it Beta Mix or Vitamix Vita or Vitamix? Vita that one's expensive, eh? Yeah, that, that's a pretty penny. Um, 
then you had the, the bullet and you had this other one, the Walmart one and ninjas and 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 so forth. So do your research and try and get um, the one that fits in your budget and um, and can you know maximize your benefit. Uh-huh. Really? Man, that's going to be a challenge. I have a question. I've never been diagnosed as having, you know, diabetes or anything, mm -hmm. but there's also low, low diabetes or whatever you want. Low blood yeah. sugar, yeah. Yeah, because like the other day, I was feeling so drained, so drained, and Ida, since she's diabetic, I said, Ida, it's 91. <laughs> it's 91. Low. She says, eat a little bit of something so you can pick it up. But it's always been, you know, like when I was uh, working as secretary with our Lady Guadalupe School, I uh, thought I was going to pass out, and a teacher comes in and she says, "Jane, what's the matter? I feel like I'm going to die." She brought me a coke and five minutes. I was oh, okay. okay. So does that mean that I have low sugar diabetes or something? The um, there that does exist. There are people who have low blood pressure, low blood sugar, and you shouldn't you know you shouldn't skip meals. <laughs> uh, that's never a good idea, um, and sometimes you may have to do, have what's called mid-meal snacks. So if you eat breakfast early in the morning, 5, 6 o'clock, and then you're not eating lunch till way at 12, then you know that's six hours. Your stomach usually empties within three to four hours. So you're putting yourself at risk for your blood sugar to, to, to drop if you do have hypoglycemia or low blood sugar. So a mid-morning snack is always good, a granola bar or, or something that um, can keep you going. Um, uh, I can't support the coke thing. <laughs> it's, it's so wrong on so many levels. <laughs> but but yes, in that uh, at that time that was that was an urgent need. Yes, yes, that was an urgent need, and they do it in the hospital sometimes. They they'll tell they'll tell some of these guys, you know, here's some juice, and they're like, what's that? Give me my Dr Pepper, you know. Yeah, so so yes, you're 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 right. Right. There are other things you can use. As a matter of fact, it's recommended that you eat something, not necessarily drink. Um, fortunately, in the hospitals, you have a lot of commercial stuff now. They have those little glucose pills and pastes and you know stuff that they can squeeze under your tongue. Um, got a lot of stuff in, in the inpatient setting. For those of us who are at home, you know, use something like you said that doesn't really spike your sugar so much. Um, I, my dad used to. He used to like to eat my mom's sweet potato pudding. You know, where we come from, it's, it's porridge, not cereal, okay? It's pudding, not pie. <laughs> so it's a little different. But he'd always cheat and take some uh, extra sweet potato pudding. But then he knew how to adjust his insulin, so he'll take a little extra. And then he'll forget to eat later. <laughs> so so it, it drops real low. And so, you know, he'd have to take something to drink or, or eat to, to get it back up. But we finally caught on to his little shenanigans and yeah, we had a talk. Yeah. All right, uh, let's see what we have in our little um, video here so far. been getting some questions from you guys about juicing. Uh, you want to know why do people juice? What are the benefits of juicing? Should you be juicing? So today I wanted to answer those questions and a few more and I'm going to cover it all in my clean and delicious Juicing 101. So what exactly does the term <laughs> juicing mean? Well, when you make a juice, what you're doing is you are squeezing all of the juice out of your produce and then discarding the pulp, which is the insoluble fiber. So really, a juice is the water and most of the nutrients that are in the plant. Now, if you were making a smoothie or blending your drink, then what you would be doing is pulverizing the produce and you would include all of the fiber. So you would have a really rich, thick, hearty drink. 
However, the benefits of juicing and removing that pulp is that your body doesn't have to do all the work of breaking down and digesting all that fiber. So it's much easier for your body to immediately absorb all of the nutrients and the enzymes that were in the produce. Think of it like this. It's a fast track way for your body to get nutrients into those cells. So it's a really easy, convenient, tasty way of getting more fruits and veggies into your system. And while I think juicing and blending are both worth incorporating into your clean and delicious lifestyle, I think juicing is especially powerful for anybody who is tired, stressed, sick, or feels some kind of cold coming on, or just plain and simply worn down. Because like I said before, really it's just a quick boost of nutrients into the body. Now, if juicing is something that you are thinking about doing at home, then you're going to have to get yourself a juicer, which is definitely a bit of an investment in both time and money. But unless you live in or near a major city, I think it's pretty tricky to get your hands on good, high quality juice. So if you are on the market for a juicer, I'm going to try to cover some of the things you need to know before you make your purchase. Now, the first thing you need to decide is whether you want a centrifugal juicer or a masticating juicer. Centrifugal juicers tend to be less expensive, but they're also a little bit less efficient and a little bit noisier. Basically what they do is they work at a high speed and they have a spinning motion. And that spinning motion grinds the produce to a pulp and forces the juice away from the pulp. A masticating juicer, on the other hand, is more versatile, but also tends to be more expensive. But not only does it make juice, you can also use it to make things like baby food, pasta, and nut butters. Now, what I have over here is the Green Star Elite Juice Extractor. And this is a masticating juicer that's known for its twin jumbo gears. And what those gears do is that they literally knead and grind the produce. So if you think about it, it works the same exact way your mouth works, your teeth work, when they're chewing food. Same concept. Plus, the masticating juicers tend to be more efficient because they get more juice away from the pulp. So at the end of the day, we're using less produce. And one more thing that I think is extremely important to note, the masticating juicers are much better at juicing dark leafy greens. And in my opinion, the whole point of making yourself some fresh juice is to get in those dark leafy greens. The masticating juicers, they also work at a lower speed and there's no spinning motion. So they tend to be less messy and quite a bit quieter. And what I really like about this one is that it has a low RPM, which means the rate that it grinds up the food. It's a slow, constant pressure. And that's a positive because when they go too fast and they go too high, the machine gets hot. And if the machine gets hot, it's going to kill some of the enzymes in your juice. So you want to look for a juicer that has a nice low RPM. For instance, this one goes at 110 RPM. Some of the juicers can go as high as 2000 RPM. And then a few other things things I would consider before buying a juicer is how noisy is the juicer, how easy or difficult is it to clean up and take apart and put back together, and do you have a place to store it? Now, when it comes to making fresh homemade juice, I want you guys to focus on your vegetables because studies actually show that fructose, which is the primary sugar in fruit juice, promotes insulin resistance and heart disease. Now, that's not the same if you are eating fresh fruit because Number one, it still has the fiber content. And number two, you're not going to eat the same amount of fruit that you would as you would need to go into a glass of fruit juice. So bottom line here, we want to focus on our vegetables and then use yummy low sugar fruits like an apple to sweeten and round out the flavor of your juice. So I'm going to make a green juice and walk you guys through the process. So the first thing that I do is I wash and I prep all of the produce I'm going to be using to make my juice. So today I've got a nice big handful of fresh parsley, three leaves of kale, one green apple, one whole cucumber, and then just a couple small chunks of ginger. This is one of my favorite combos for making a fresh green juice. As for my juicer, I put the drip tray underneath. Then on top of that, I've got my pitcher. That's going to catch the fresh squeezed juice. And then under here, I put a little bowl because this spout right here, that's where all of the pulp comes out of. Then once I have everything ready to go, I'm going to plug my juicer in. 
This juicer actually has a detachable cord, which I like because it makes it easier to store. And then I remove the safety tray lid. And you'll see that there's the chute right there. That's where all of the produce is gonna go. So once I've got everything ready to go, I'm gonna turn on my juicer. You can hear that it's pretty quiet for a juicer. And then I'm gonna grab a few of my kale leaves, roll them up, and then stick them right into the chute. Now right away I can feel that the gears down there, they kind of pull it in and they start grinding it up. But I also have these two plungers to help with um, pushing the produce down. So this plastic one only goes so far down, it won't hit the gears and it helps to kind of assist the food go down. But you also have this wooden one, which is awesome because this one is long enough to go all the way down to the gears so you can push the produce all the way in there, but it won't hurt the gears and the gears won't hurt it. So it's like you've got two little extra helping hands. So I'm gonna finish up my kale. Then next up, I'm gonna throw in my ginger. The ginger gives it a little kick, plus it's really good for digestion and for circulation. I've got that cucumber, one whole cucumber. You always wanna use something like a cucumber or celery in these green juices because they have a high water content, so it helps to kind of dilute the intensity of the greens, plus they're really cool and refreshing. I've got fresh parsley, which has a lot of vitamin C, so it's a really good immunity booster. And then last but not least, I've got one sweet and tart green apple. I love the green apple because like I said before, it's a low sugar, but it also has a nice sweet tart flavor that helps round out the flavor of the juice. And you can see what's happening here. All the juice is coming down into the pitcher and the pulp is coming out the spout into the bowl. Okay, so you guys can see now, all of that produce I had made about a cup and a half of juice. And in this bowl, this was all of the leftover pulp from the produce. Now, personally, I have yet to do anything with this yet, but I did read online that people will toss it into salads and soups and treat it just like a little extra fiber. And some people will even make raw crackers or a pizza crust with it. And then there are those that just give it to their dogs. So I'm curious if you guys do this, what do you do with your extra pulp? Come on down to the comments below and please share the information with me and the rest of us. Okay, so I'm gonna pour this into my mason jar and give it a try. Mm. Ooh, it's so green. And that ginger really gives it a nice little kick. There's something about drinking green juice, I don't know if it's mental, but it just feels good. Mm. And guys, what I usually do when I'm juicing and I'm breaking out my juicer and getting into it, I always make more than I need in that moment because that's a huge time saver. And that's another thing I like about the Green Star is that it has a special technology in there that actually delays the oxidation process so I can store the juice in my fridge for up to three days with minimal loss of the vitamins and the nutrients and the enzymes. Huge time saver. Mm. So guys, that is all of the basics you need to know when it comes to juicing. And like always, I am now curious to hear from you. Are you already juicing? Are you thinking about juicing? Do you have any other questions or thoughts when it comes to juicing? <laughs> so, so we save some of the fiber for core boost. <laughs> So, um, so that's a, another option you have if you, um, now I do believe chewing is very important. So if you can chew on those apples and stuff, that's very good. Now, if, you, if you're pressed for time and you, you, know, you gotta get off to work and you want to keep uh, a small amount of that with you at work to have it for breakfast or lunch, then that's convenient. You know, that's easier than showing up to work with you know, all that stuff <laughs> and preparing it and trying to eat it. So. Um, uh, yeah, so that's uh, about it. A uh, little bit of nutrition. Nutrition is a huge topic. You can't live without food, okay? Even if you're, uh, you're unconscious, they're gonna put a tube in your nose or in your belly. <laughs> 
to make you get your nutrients. And if your gut is not working, they're going to give you TPN. You know, God knows that we needed that, and that's why He's made the provision. And um, and this is one way we can uh, look at it and stay healthy and um, be a blessing to Him and others. Okay. Any other questions? When Mrs. White says not to mix fruits and vegetables at the same meal, that's exactly what you're doing. Okay. Uh, <laughs> We have to go back and read her quotations in the, in the context. Some of her quotation when she talks about fruits and vegetables is referring about the, having the weak stomach. Then you may need to go over those quotations as well because if we have a weak stomach and we have problem with the stomach, it's not good for us. Other reason why she wrote those quotations is because too much variety. And if you read some other quotation of her, she tells that the variety of the meals should be two or three varieties. In other words, you have the grains, you have the protein, and you have the, the fruits or the veggie. She puts the fruits and veggie in different category. She never had in her one meal fruits and veggie of the same because of the too much variety for digestion process. Like she will be against our potluck, for example, <laughs> because we put a lot uh, on our plates. We put a lot of varieties. You end up with six, seven varieties. Mm. And she does not recommend because it's a burden on the, the stomach. stomach. Mm. The enzyme process, mm. okay, and the digestion process. For this area, we should limit to have the veggie, have the lasagna, and maybe a piece of bread, and that is the three variety. We're okay. not cutting out the potluck. We're just saying that <laughs> no, the choose other. the right stuff for you, the right amount, and right. etc. cetera. Yes. from this Loma Linda cardiologist, he said it has to do with the alkalinity and the acidosis of the blood. And so the only fruits you can mix with a vegetable meal are citrus food, Fruits mm -hmm. and pineapple for whatever reason. Right. Okay. That's why she used the. That's why she used the apple. Now, I need to debate you. I need to uh -oh. debate that. <laughs> you go on the internet and you type tables for acid, alkaline.